Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Musney, and I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Welcome to this talk, sponsored by LabRoots and the Infectious Diseases Virtual Event. My topic today is, is bacterial vaginosis a sexually transmitted infection? And this is actually a very controversial part of our field right now. Um, and so today I will be talking about some of the evidence for and against whether or not BV is a sexually transmitted infection. I have several disclosures for this presentation uh, listed on this slide. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before I get into the presentation is that I will be accepting questions on this presentation uh, via email. So if you have any questions or need any clarifications, please send a message and I will respond back to you as soon as I can. So the outline for this talk today, I will do a brief review of the U.S. and global prevalence of bacterial vaginosis, its diagnosis and current treatment. Then I will spend more time reviewing the epidemiology of bacterial vaginosis, particularly as it relates to sexual transmission. And during my talk about that, I'm going to discuss a few current hypotheses that we have regarding the etiology of BV, presuming that it is an STI. Uh, and these hypotheses really deal about whether or not BV is caused by a single pathogen or a polymicrobial consortium of pathogens that lead to BV. So bacterial vaginosis is the most common cause of vaginal discharge. The U.S. prevalence per the last NHANES data was about 30%, so one in every three women, approximately. Um, BV is associated with multiple adverse gynecologic and reproductive health outcomes, including preterm birth, low birth weight, postoperative gynecological infections, and increased risk for acquisition and transmission of HIV and sexually transmitted infections. We do know that BV is characterized by depletion of vaginal lactobacilli and increases in facultative and strict anaerobic bacteria. I have several of these listed on this slide as they are very pertinent to this presentation today. So Gardnerella vaginalis is a facultative anaerobic bacteria involved in BV and several key strict anaerobic bacteria are Prevotella bivia, Adipobium vaginae, BVAB1 through 3, Megasphera species, and Synethia species. This slide comes from a paper that was just published about three months ago in the Sexually Transmitted Diseases Journal showing the current global burden of bacterial vaginosis around the world. Um, I had mentioned it's about 30% prevalence in the United States um, and similar prevalences in other countries around the world between 24, 23%, up to 29%. Um, also, in the figure to the right, you can see the prevalence of BV stratified uh, by race and also non-pregnant women versus pregnant women. And as you can see here, African-American women that are pregnant actually have the highest prevalence of BV worldwide, according to this recent publication. There are two ways that we currently diagnose BV. Uh, the first is, as I'm sure you're all well aware of, the AMSO criteria, which is what we use in clinical practice. And you have to have three out of four of these criteria needed for a BV diagnosis. These include a homogeneous vaginal discharge, a vaginal pH that's elevated, greater than 4.5, a positive whiff test, and greater than 20% of clue cells per high power field on a wet mount of vaginal secretions. The second way we currently diagnose BV is more done in research settings, which is by the Nugent score. This is uh, performed on a vaginal gram stain, uh, which is looked at under the microscope. And I have three pictures on this slide to the right showing three different categories of the Nugent score. Um, a Nugent score of zero to three is a lactobacillus predominant vaginal flora, where you see a lot of these gram-positive rods that are vaginal lactobacilli. 
and you can see the squamous epithelial cells at the top are very clean looking, and you can see the nucleus very well. A Nugent score of four to six is consistent with intermediate vaginal flora with the emergence of that facultative anaerobe I had mentioned, Gardnerella vaginalis. Here you start to see some of the stippling of the vaginal epithelial cell, um, and it's not as clean with all the lactobacilli that you see on the slide above. And finally, a Nugent score of 7 to 10, which is the bottom picture on the right, is consistent with BV, and this is pretty much the complete disappearance of healthy vaginal lactobacilli with numerous Gardnerella vaginalis and Mobiluncus other strict anaerobes. And as you can see here, this vaginal epithelial cell in the picture on the right, bottom right, is completely covered with all of these bacteria, and you cannot clearly see the nucleus of the cell. Also, the borders of the cell are obscured. And so this is a classic clue cell that you may also see on a wet mount of vaginal fluids. Current treatment recommendations for BV in this country are based on the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines. I do want to call your attention that new guidelines are currently being worked on, and they are planned to come out in 2020 next year by the CDC. So be sure to check that out. Uh, to see if any of these current recommendations are updated or changed when that becomes available. But currently, right now, the recommended regimens are 500 milligrams twice a day of metronidazole orally or metronidazole gel daily for five days or clindamycin cream uh, intravaginally at bedtime for seven days. There are several alternative medications, including tinidazole, two different doses and two different uh, durations of therapy, oral clindamycin, and then clindamycin ovules, which are all listed on this slide. It's important to recognize that despite these treatment options that we currently have available, BV recurrence is very common. And this is shown very well in a prior study by Jackie Sobel and colleagues of time to BV recurrence in a group of women that they followed for 28 weeks, they had actually randomized these women to either placebo or uh, suppressive metronidazole therapy. And by 28 weeks, 75% of the women that were on the placebo arm of this study had a BV recurrence, uh, compared to 51% of women who had a BV recurrence that were taking suppressive metronidazole therapy in this study. So BV recurrence was extremely common, really in both arms of the, this study, however, more so in the placebo arm of women that weren't taking any type of therapy. We think that currently one of the major reasons that recurrence is so common among women with BV despite treatment is that BV is a biofilm community. And really the biofilm portrays what you're seeing on these clue cells um, it's, it's currently believed that the clue cell is actually a BV, uh, it's covered by all of these strict and facultative anaerobic bacteria which comprise a biofilm community, and that is what is occurring on these vaginal epithelial cells, causing the stippling of the cells that we saw in the pictures on the previous slides. Um, one of the sentinel studies to Identify that BV is a biofilm community was uh, published in 2005 by Alexander Swazinski, um, and he found in that study that the biofilm is mainly composed of Gardnerella vaginalis, which composed 60 to 90 percent of the biofilm mass. Adipobium vaginae com comprise a smaller proportion of the biofilm, and then Lactobacillus species comprise a very small proportion of the biofilm. It's important to note in this Sentinel study that he only had probes for these bacteria, and so there may likely be other BV-associated bacteria that are also part of the biofilm. However, we currently don't know exactly what those are and is an area of active research in this field. So I kind of want to get into the epidemiology of BV with regards to sexual transmission. Um, there's a large body of data, if you review the literature, which supports the sexual transmission of BV-associated bacteria. Uh, however, there is a big controversy in the field, as I previously mentioned, about what causes BV. We currently don't know if it's one pathogen that causes BV 
or a group of pathogens that causes BV that could both potentially be sexually transmitted. However, some of the epidemiological data that we have available has shown that BV is associated with inconsistent condom use and increased numbers of recent and lifetime sexual partners. Women with BV have an earlier median age of sexual debut than women without. The most significant risk factor for incident BV or a new case of BV is a new sexual partner, while that for recurrent BV is a regular sexual partner. There's also been found a high level of concordance of having BV or not having BV by Nugent score that has been found in women who have sex with women and their female sexual partners. So a lot of these data are summarized in the papers listed below that I have on this slide um, and, and correspond with a large body of epidemiological data that supports that BV may be sexually transmitted. As I have alluded to uh, earlier in this presentation, there are likely some key BV-associated bacteria uh, that have been discussed and highly looked at in the literature. Um, and I have them listed here on this slide. Gardnerella vaginalis is definitely one of them. Uh, Adipobium prevotella leptotrichia megasphera type 1, Senethia species, and the Clostridia-like bacteria BVAB1, 2, and 3. All of these bacteria have high specificity for BV. And particularly with regards to Gardnerella vaginalis, it has been found to be present in 95 to 100% of BV cases. Gardnerella vaginalis is also the BV-associated bacteria that has had the most research done on it to date uh, over the past 50 to 60 years. These key BV-associated bacteria on this slide are all more common in BV compared to normal flora. However, only Gardnerella vaginalis, Adipobium vaginae, Megasphera type 1, and BVAB2 have been found to be independently associated with BV. In addition, Gardnerella, Megasphera, type 1, BVAB2, BVAB3, Senethia, and Leptotrichia are also rare or absent in sexually unexposed women. In the literature, Gardnerella vaginalis, as I have mentioned, has been studied the most with regards to the pathogenesis of BV. It's been found to be more virulent than other BV-associated bacteria. This was shown very nicely in several of the studies I have listed on this slide, which were in vitro studies of virulence factors of Gardnerella, Adipobium, Prevotella, and Mobilonchus. Only Gardnerella vaginalis demonstrated all three virulence factors in this study, which included adherence to host receptor sites on vaginal epithelial cells, cytotoxicity specific for host receptor cells, which includes vaginolysin, which is produced by Gardnerella vaginalis and is a pore-forming toxin that lyses cells. Gardnerella also has been found to be able to uh, start BB biofilm formation, which is extremely important, as I mentioned, that the biofilm is a, a big part of BB. The authors of these studies uh, suggested that other organisms or other BV-associated bacteria besides Gardnerella vaginalis may be relatively avirulent opportunists that colonize the BV biofilm after initiation of infection by Gardnerella. It's also important to note that Gardnerella produces a salidase and prolidase, which degrade mucin and IgA uh, in the vaginal tract. Uh, other studies have also shown in vitro that Gardnerella is more virulent than other BV-associated bacteria. Um, it's been shown that Gardnerella has the greatest capacity to adhere to vaginal epithelial cells in the presence of Lactobacillus crispatus, which is thought to be one of the predominant healthy vaginal flora. Um, this is compared to Adipobium, Prevotella, Mobilonchus, and Fusobacterium. In addition, the effect of Gardnerella vaginalis biofilms on the adherence and growth of other BV-associated bacteria has been quantified uh, by quantitative PCR. Interestingly, Gardnerella vaginalis derived a growth benefit from the addition of a second BV-associated bacteria species regardless of the species. Conversely, Gardnerella vaginalis biofilms enhance the growth of Prevotella into a minor extent Fusobacterium in this study. 
So this leads me to one of the hypotheses in the field about the pathogenesis of BB. And this is actually a paper that our group at UAB published uh, five years ago now uh, for our hypothetical model for the pathogenesis of incident BV. Um, and we base this model on an extensive review of the literature uh, at that time, and you can see the citation for this paper if you're interested in reading it in more depth. But basically, we hypothesized that BV is a sexually transmitted infection and that Gardnerella vaginalis is the primary pathogen that, if sexually transmitted, will cause BV in the exposed partner. Uh, basically, in this model, we suggested that a virulent strain of Gardnerella vaginalis would be sexually transmitted, come in, adhere to the vaginal epithelial cells, uh, and compete with the lactobacilli to the point where Gardnerella overtakes them and allows its growth to expand. Um, then once Gardnerella vaginalis comes in as a facultative anaerobe into this environment, starts multiplying and expanding, the lactose are going down, we hypothesize that other BV-associated bacteria would start overgrowing since Gardnerella vaginalis had changed the vaginal environment to make it more suitable for anaerobic growth. We thought that several of these other BV-associated bacteria would be present in very low numbers in women uh, normally and acquired during birth from their mother. Um, and once Gardnerella starts this process of making an anaerobic environment and growing, these other BV-associated bacteria may overgrow. With that, uh, the BV biofilm would be formed uh, and causing some of the symptoms that you see with BV. So this uh, was our hypothesis back in 2014. However, there are some proponents to this hypothesis. Um, there are some in the field that state that how can Gardnerella vaginalis be the primary pathogen in bacterial vaginosis if it's been found in virgins? Uh, if it's an STD and it's causing BV, how can this be happening in women who are not having sex? And so one of the early studies on this topic that's controversial was published by Bump in the Obstetrics and Gynecology Journal in 1988. And in this study, they had 52 postmenarchial virginal women that were ages 14 to 17 years old. And 12% of these women had BV by AMSEL criteria, and 17% of the women had Gardnerella vaginalis by vaginal culture. In contrast, rates of other STDs such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas were very low in this group of women, which you can see all of this depicted in this table that I have on the slide. Um, and so, you know, the investigators in this study said, how can Gardnerella vaginalis be a BV STD pathogen if it's seen in virginal women? The interesting thing about these virginal women is who they were in this study. So the, the women that participated in this study were actually the, the daughters of several of the people involved in conducting the study and their friends. And so it's a little suspect if they were actually uh, being truthful about their sexual history at that time, although, of course, we can't prove that now, 20, 25 years later. Um, in addition, the authors of the study only asked about penile vaginal sex to these women and not other forms of sex, which could potentially transmit a bacterial pathogen. So there is a little controversy about this study. Uh, in addition, Schaefer published uh, another study of virginal women that found a small proportion of Gardnerella vaginalis in the Journal of Pediatrics. Um, there were 19 non-sexually active women in this study compared to 152 sexually active women, and they found Gardnerella vaginalis in about 30% of the women, of these 19 women, that did not uh, report any sexual activity. Proponents of the Gardnerella vaginalis hypothesis also state that it has not fulfilled Koch's postulates by itself for disease causation, which this can get kind of complicated, and I have it summarized here on this slide. And if anyone has a question about this, feel free to email me, 
later on uh, after you've heard this presentation. I'm happy to discuss. Um, but there's four postulates for, for Koch's postulate. First, the microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, but should not be found in healthy organisms. So Gardnerella vaginalis has been found in 92% of women with BV by culture. This is all in the Sentinel studies uh, done about BV in the 1950s by Gardner and Dukes. However, some say that Gardnerella does not fulfill this first postulate because it has since been found in normal, healthy women and virginal women. Second, the microorganism must be isolated from a diseased organism and grown in pure culture. This has been done with Gardnerella vaginalis in 141 women with BV. So this one is not controversial. The third postulate is that the cultured microorganism should cause disease when introduced into a healthy organism. In original studies of Gardnerella vaginalis, only one of 13 women inoculated with it developed the clinical symptoms of BV. It's interesting to note, however, that in this study, uh, this original study, that the type of Gardnerella vaginalis that was inoculated into healthy women was not in the exponential phase of growth. It was in the lag phase of growth. So they actually reproduced this experiment several years later where they inoculated women with Gardnerella vaginalis isolates in the exponential phase of growth and, and more of the women developed BV than previously. Of course, these experiments were done in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, before the IRB was uh, standardized in this country. And unfortunately, for good reasons, these types of exper experiments cannot be reproduced today because of the major ethics associated with them. Finally, the fourth postulate is that the microorganism must be re-isolated from an inoculated diseased experimental host and identified as being identical to the original specific causative agent. So pure cultures of Gardnerella vaginalis have been obtained from one patient inoculated with this organism who developed BV. So this postulate has been fulfilled. So really postulates one and three are the ones that are still controversial to this day. Additional proponents of this hypothesis state that the microbiology of BV is heterogeneous. You would think that if Gardnerella was the pathogen, all the women would just have Gardnerella. Um, however, when they've looked at uh, the constitution of the vaginal microbiome in vaginal microbiome studies, they have found that BV is a syndrome and not a pathogen. And one woman's BV may not be the same as another woman's BV. So you have subject A and subject B on this slide, uh, of which different proportions of certain BV-associated bacteria have been found. And they're not exactly the same, as you can clearly tell by looking at these two pie charts. Um, so that's a little bit of controversial as well in the field. And finally, proponents of the Gardnerella vaginalis hypothesis state, or of BV being an STD, state that if that is actually true, if we treat a woman that has BV, we should also treat her male sexual partner, just like we do for all of the other STDs. And that should reduce recurrent rate, recurrence rates in that female woman. However, there have been six male partner treatment trials of women with recurrent BV who randomized the men, their male partners, to either certain doses of metronidazole or placebo. And interestingly, five out of these six trials did not show a significant benefit. And so currently, partner treatment for women with BV is not recommended by the CDC um, based on these older trials. I do want to note here on this chart, we have summarized these trials in a recent publication that our group did. You can see that these trials were conducted in the early or to mid-1985 all the way up until 1997. So these are definitely older trials. And I will mention that uh, some colleagues here in this country, Jackie Sobel again and Jane Schwepke here at UAB, are actually conducting a current male partner treatment trial of women with recurrent BV um, in the current era to see if it shows a significant effect. So be on the lookout for that data coming out in the next one to two years because that trial is currently wrapping up 
enrollment. Um, I have a slide here talking about the one trial that reported that male partner treatment had an effect on BV in the female partners. Um, and this was published in the Journal of Family Practice in 1989 by Mingle et al. Um, and you can read this study to see uh, what they found, but at two weeks there was no clear difference in clinical cure rate by BV by, R by either arm of the study. However, at two and five weeks, women whose partners were treated had less BV by vaginal gram stain. In addition, at eight weeks, women whose partners were treated were more likely to report resolution of their symptoms. However, the study did have multiple methodological issues. Their results were presented graphically and their effect sizes were not stated in this study. So uh, Dr. Maida actually wrote a very good article on the limitations of these prior male partner treatment studies and, and providing rationale that new treatment trials in the current era should be conducted. So I, I put on a slide all of the limitations she had discussed about these prior male partner treatment trials because this is also controversial, whether or not these trials are truly rigorous enough uh, to tell us that we should definitely not be treating male partners and women with BV. In all six of those trials, the study drug was delivered to the male by the female and no measures of compliance were noted, which could have affected outcomes. In addition, these trials had insufficient power to detect reasonable effect sizes. Randomization methods were deficient or insufficiently reported. Adherence to therapy in the men was infrequently reported. And many of the treatment regimens used in these trials, including a single two-gram dose of metronidazole, is now not considered effective therapy for BV. Clearly, uh, as I mentioned, one of the recommended therapies currently in the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines is a a uh, seven-day dose of 500 milligrams twice a day of metronidazole. So this sort of led me to a study that I have been conducting over the past several years, which is actually a vaginal microbiome study to look more into the pathogenesis of incident BV, uh, because we had been on the Gardnerella vaginalis hypothesis. However, there are some issues with that hypothesis. Uh, as I have been discussing during this presentation. So this current study that I wanted to talk to you about today used molecular methods to determine the sequence of microbiological events leading up to a new case of BV among sexually active African-American women who have sex with women. And you may ask, well, why did I pick this particular population of women to do this study in? And it's mainly because African-American women have a high prevalence of BV as do women who have sex with women. And so I thought they would be a more high-risk population to study uh, these microbiological events leading up to incident BV. Uh, this was a prospective study that we conducted here in Birmingham, Alabama at our local STD clinic at our health department. To enroll in the study, the women had to have normal vaginal flora with no AMSAL criteria and a normal Nugent score. And we followed them daily with vaginal swabs for the development of incident BV. And we define this as having a Nugent score of seven to 10 on at least two to three consecutive days or for 90 days they were followed in the study if they did not develop incident BV. We had originally hypothesized that sexual exposure to Gardnerella was the inciting event leading to the complex changes in vaginal flora associated with BV. We thought that if Gardnerella was the initial insult, then its appearance and estab establishment in the vaginal microbiome would be seen in women who develop incident BV prior to increases in some of these other key BV-associated bacteria. And we also thought if BV is an STD, its incubation period should be similar to other bacterial STIs, such as gonorrhea, which is usually between two to seven days. Uh, we had screening Methods for this study, which I have listed on the slide, women had to be female, uh, ages 18 to 45, have a history of sex with another female during the past year, and have a current female sex partner. They could not have used antimicrobials within the past 14 days or had known HIV. They could not be pregnant or currently on their menstrual period. They also performed a urine pregnancy test uh, just to uh, rule out women who were pregnant. And then they did a sexual history and self-collected vaginal swabs for AMSAL criteria and Nugent score. 
Enrollment criteria for this study, as I mentioned, they had to have no AMSO criteria and a Nugent score of zero to three. They could not be pregnant. They could not have trichomonas on a wet mount, and they could not have a symptomatic vaginal yeast infection, as we thought these other conditions would confound the vaginal microbiome data related to BV. If they were enrolled, they completed an enrollment study questionnaire. They had a pelvic exam with specimens collected for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas, uh, nucleic acid amplification testing. They then practiced completion of their daily diaries. They had sexual uh, practices recorded on these diaries, which I have a picture coming up the next slide. And then they self-collected two vaginal swabs for Nugent score and vaginal microbiome sequencing uh, until the development of incident BV or for 90 days. Uh, participants were excluded after initial enrollment if they had a duplicate baseline Nugent score greater than three, which was read by our research lab, or if one of their NAT tests came back positive for an STD. Here's a copy of our daily study diary, which was a one-piece page of paper that were given to participants, and it asked a variety of questions about their whether or not they had sex that day, their partner gender, partner types, and race of their partners, in addition to a large number of daily sexual practices, whether or not they were having symptoms, and if they were taking any medications on that particular day. So the primary endpoint in this study was the development of incident BV, as I mentioned. Uh, the daily vaginal gram stains were read all by myself and a second reader. We had a third, if, if myself and the second reader did not agree on a read, we had a third reader to do the tiebreaker. And then for women who had incident BV and controls matched by age, race, and menstrual cycle day who did not develop incident BV in this study and maintained a normal Nugent score, we did DNA extraction on their vaginal swab specimens in the 21 days leading up to incident BV and every other day for several days thereafter. And then we performed 16S RNA gene sequencing targeting the V4 region uh, of the 16S gene at a MySeq machine. This was done at the Louisiana State University Health Science Center with my colleagues Chris Taylor and David Martin. Uh, we had a large bioinformatics pipeline that was used um, to bring us down to the species level of the vaginal bacteria in the specimens in this study, which I have listed the methodology on this slide. I'm not going to go through this into detail. Uh, statistical analyses were also done that were performed using R by my biostatistician colleagues. Um, basically, the longitudinal microbiome data for BV candidate bacteria, which I've mentioned to you earlier, and several lactobacilli of interest were analyzed using the PhiloSeq library. The relative abundance of each vaginal species per sample was the measure used for analysis in this study. And we looked at percentile-based bootstrap confidence intervals to evaluate the variation and trends of abundance of bacterial species of interest over time. The results of this study, uh, we enrolled for about three and a half years. Enrollment completed last year. We had 203 women present to the clinic for study screening. Uh, interestingly, about 13% were not consented or screened for this study for various reasons. Of the remaining 176 screened, 24% met all enrollment criteria and consented to the study. You may say, well, why is it so low, uh, the women that got enrolled into the study? And it's mainly because a lot of the women that we screened had a Nugent score greater than three. So they had abnormal vaginal floor at baseline and were not eligible for the study. Of the 42 women that were enrolled, 15 developed incident BV, and one was dropped due to having a chlamydia diagnosis at baseline. And then 16S sequencing was done for 14 incident BV cases and eight women maintaining normal vaginal flora to comprise a total of 448 vaginal specimens. This table shows the characteristics of women in the incident BV group in this study compared to the women in the normal group. There were no significant differences with regards to age uh, and other baseline demographic characteristics, history of STIs, or contraception use among women in this study. Uh, the next slide goes into the results for this study. We had heat maps uh, that were uh, made for each of the women in this study. 
Um, and due to the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all the details on these heat maps, but you can see the changes in the vaginal flora that occur in the women with incident BB and the changes in some of the bacteria that are going up and going down on these heat maps. If you refer to the paper listed on the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, we actually have a heat map for all 14 women in this study that got incident BV. And on the next slide, we also have heat maps for the women in the study that maintained a normal vaginal flora. So you can look at their heat maps in comparison and contrast to the heat maps of the women that got incident BV. If you look at all of the heat maps together, um, to summarize them, the majority of women uh, that maintain normal vaginal flora had a lactobacillus crispatus dominant vaginal microbiota starting in the study. In contrast, the majority of the women who developed incident BV got, were dominated by other lactobacilli, including inners and gensinii or gasseri, prior to the onset of BV. The onset of menses destabilized the vaginal microbiota and preceded the development of incident B BV in 35% of cases. And in some cases, BV resolved on its own after menses ceased, interestingly. In addition, the majority of BV cases had detectable Gardnerella vaginalis and other BV-associated bacteria prior to the development of incident BV. And sex immediately preceded development of incident BV by one to two days in 64% of cases in this study. The next uh, two slides show a specific statistical analysis for specific BV-associated bacteria. And so these uh, figures can be a little complicated. I just want to review them very quickly. Um, basically, on the x-axis on the bottom of the slide, you can see the days. Day zero is the first day of incident BV. And so if there are minus days on the bottom, those are days preceding incident BV. And then on the y-axis is the difference in the mean relative abundance between incident BV cases and women maintaining normal vaginal flora in this study. So we actually found that Prevotella bivia became significantly higher in women with incident BV four days before the onset of incident BV. Garnerella vaginalis became significantly higher three days prior to incident BV. And then adipobium vaginae and megasphere type 1 became significantly higher on the day of incident BV in, in those women compared to women maintaining normal vaginal flora. When we looked at other organisms, including Synethia, Fingoldia, Lactobacillus inners, and BBAB1, 2, and 3, the mean relative abundance of these organisms was not significantly different between groups in this study prior to incident BV. And so we basically concluded that Prevotella bivia, Gardnerella, Adipobium, and perhaps Megasphera type 1 were uh, key players in the pathogenesis of incident BV. Also importantly to mention in this study, uh, sexual activity occurred in 90 3% of women at a median of four days prior to the development of incident BV. So similar to what I had mentioned earlier, if BV is a bacterial STD, we think its incubation period may be anywhere between two and four days based on the results of this study. Also, when we looked at the very specific sexual practices that we collected in the daily diary in this study, we found that any sexual activity was significantly associated with incident BV. Having sex with a woman, female partner, was significantly associated with BV. Participating in any digital vaginal sex was associated with BV. Any digital anal sex was associated with BV. And using fingers or hands on the vagina was uh, significantly associated with BV. So all of these are sexual risk factors that were significantly associated with BV in this study. So we basically concluded that the onset of menses and sexual activity were destabilizing forces in the vaginal microbiota in this study. The relative abundance of Prevotella bivia and Gardnerella became significantly higher in women with incident BV starting four days before and three days before the onset. And you may wonder, well, which one came first? And it's really hard to say because we only collected daily vaginal swab specimens. I think that 
to, to really tease out this issue. In future studies, we have to collect more than once daily vaginal swab specimens, perhaps twice a day or even three times a day to see which one actually comes in first in women getting incident BV. Um, in contrast, as I mentioned, the relative abundance of adipobium and megasphere type 1 became significantly higher in women on the day of incident BV, so later on. And then the relative abundance of other BV-associated bacteria was not significantly higher during incident BV in this study. There are several limitations of this study. We had a small sample size. The sensitivity of our Nugent score can be as low as 65% in the best of hands. Uh, these were sexually experienced women in the study. These were not virgins who became sexually active, so they're probably not the optimal population as they have, several of them have had BV before. Uh, the survey questionnaire and their daily diary data were based on self-report and subject to bias from that. And then the controls were currently based on women who maintain normal vaginal flora. We did not include as controls women who developed intermediate vaginal flora in this study, which should be looked at in the future. So we have somewhat refined our current hypothesis for the pathogenesis of BV based on the results of these studies. We basically think now that Gardnerella is necessary but not sufficient um, to perhaps cause BV. It may be that synergy between Prevotella bivia and Gardnerella vaginalis may be a second important event causing BV. And I've actually reviewed the literature on this topic recently, and there was a study published now in 1997, so more than 20 years ago, that basically showed that Gardnerella vaginalis and Prevotella bivia in vitro have a highly synergistic relationship where Gardnerella vaginalis produces amino acids that Prevotella bivia utilizes, and Prevotella bivia produces ammonia that Gardnerella vaginalis utilize. So this synergistic relationship may be a key event at the beginning of incident BV. In addition, there is evidence in the literature of synergy between Gardnerella vaginalis and Adipobium vaginae, which also may be an important event prior to BV development. It's known that Adipobium vaginae rarely occurs in the absence of Gardnerella vaginalis. And women with Gardnerella and Adipobium have higher rates of recurrent BV than women with Gardnerella alone. In addition, Adipobium stimulates an innate immune response from vaginal epithelial cells in greater magnitude than Gardnerella vaginalis, suggesting that it is a potent component of the host immune response to BV, and it may help to contribute to the adverse reproductive and gynecologic outcomes associated with BV. And so now we have revised our hypothetical model for the pathogenesis of incident BV, which I have listed on this slide. We're currently in the process of writing this up and getting it published. Um, but we have four steps in this current model. The first step is a normal situation with a layer of lactobacilli on the epithelial cells of the normal vaginal microbiota with a low pH less than 4.5. We then think that a virulent strain of Gardnerella vaginalis from sexual exposure still displaces the vaginal lactobacilli and initiates BV biofilm formation. We think then that proteolysis by Gardnerella produces these amino acids that I mentioned enhance the growth of Prevotella bivia, and Prevotella bivia perhaps may join the Gardnerella vaginalis biofilm. This definitely needs to be looked at to see if Prevotella is part of the biofilm because it has not been published to date that I'm aware of. Then, as I previously mentioned, ammonia produced by Prevotella bivia may enhance Gardnerella vaginalis growth. And then sialidase produced by both Prevotella bivia and Gardnerella may promote breakdown of the mucin layer of the vaginal epithelium and increased adherence of these other strict anaerobes that may be there in very small numbers acquired from the mother at birth. This could include Adipobium vaginae, and these bacteria may join the upper layers of the BV biofilm. Without the presence of vaginal lactobacilli and with the emergence of an anaerobic mixed species BV biofilm, other indigenous anaerobes may then be able to join, and their role in BV development is still unknown. 
And so this leads me to the end of this presentation. I know I presented a lot of data to you today, and a lot of it is controversial. And so I'm happy if you have any comments about any of the data or hypotheses that I have talked about today, um, or any questions that I will be more than happy to try to answer. But I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this presentation. Um, my email address is listed on the slide, or you can also email me through the LabRoot system. Thank you very much, and have a nice day.